As you know, in previous sessions we have already covered two forms of polymorphism. One was subtyping, which was usually associated with object-oriented programming. The other was generics, which came originally from functional programming. Once you combine subtyping and generics, there are subtle interactions that we are going to explore in this session and the next one. In particular, we are going to develop an important method in this session to find out when one type can be a subtype of another. That method is called the Liskov Substitution Principle. In the last session, we have encountered the two principal forms of polymorphism. Subtyping, where we can pass instances of a subtype where a base type was required, and generics, where we can parameterize types with other types. In this session, we will look at the interactions between the two concepts. There are essentially two main areas to cover. The first one is bounds, where we can subject type parameters to subtype constraints. And the second is variance, that defines how parameterized types behave under subtyping. So let's look at type bounds first. As a motivating example, Consider you want to write a method assert all pos or assert all positive. That method should take an inset and it should return the inset is itself, but it should check whether all elements of the inset are positive. If they are not, then it thro should throw an exception. What would be the best type you can give to assert all pos? You might come up with this type here. Assert all pos, well, it would take an inset and it would return an inset. And, uh, well, in the case where not all elements are positive, it would throw an exception, but that's not reflected in the result type. And that's fine for most situations, but maybe one can be more precise. In fact, if we look at the behavior of assert all pos, then we see that it's governed essentially by two equations that we said assert all pos of empty is empty and assert all pos of a non-empty set is, well it's either another non-empty set or rather the same that we passed in or it throws an exception. So what we see in particular is that if assert or pause gets an empty uh, argument, then it would give you back an empty result. And if it gets a non-empty argument, it would give you back a non-empty result. And that knowledge is actually not reflected in this type here, where we say, well, it takes an inset and gives you back an inset. So how can we capture that additional knowledge? So one way to express it is this way. We could say assert all pos, it takes some type S that must be some subtype of inset, either empty or non-empty, and an, a set of that type itself, and it will return a result of the same type. So here the part that says less than colon inset is an upper bound of the type parameter S. What it means is that we can instantiate S to any type argument as long as the type argument conforms to the bound, conforms to inset. We also will use the symbol less than colon outside of type bounds. So generally, S less than colon T will mean S is a subtype of T. So we have S and we have T, and S is a subtype of T. Whereas S greater than T means the opposite, so S is a supertype of T, or otherwise put, T is a subtype of S. So we've seen upper bounds, where the type variable ranged over all subtypes of a given type. Scala actually also has lower bounds. So we could say a bound S is a supertype of non-empty. And that would introduce a type parameter S that can range only over the supertypes of non-empty. So in our case uh, of the inset example, S could be one of either non-empty, inset, any ref, or any. You might ask, 
where are lower bounds useful and it's not immediately apparent but we'll see later on in this session an important use case where lower bounds are indeed essential. Finally it's also possible to mix a lower bound with an upper bound so that you would write like here. You could say S is bounded from below by non-empty and from above by inset and that would then restrict any actual argument for S to a type that's in the interval between non-empty and inset. In our case that interval actually contains only the two types non-empty and inset because we have this inheritance relationship but in general there could of course be more types between the lower bound and the upper bound. So now that we've looked at bounds there's still another thing to consider. So we know that non-empty is a subtype of inset. What about if we wrap both types in a list? Should a list of non-empty also be a subtype of list of inset? Intuitively this makes sense. A list of non-empty sets is obviously a special case of a list of arbitrary sets. So from a domain modeling perspective, list of non-empty should indeed be a subtype of list of insets. So we call types for which this relationship holds covariant because the subtyping relationship varies exactly like the type parameter. In our case then it would make sense to make list into a covariant type. The question to ask then of course is that a property just of list or should all types be covariant? Is covariant something that every parameterized type should be? So to get some perspective on it let's look at the concept of arrays in Java and also in C Sharp which is in this respect bug for bug compatible with Java. If you don't know Java or C-sharp, then the only thing you need to know here really is that an array of elements of type T is written T brackets in Java. And in Scala we actually express that slightly differently. We would use a normal parameterized type syntax array of T to refer to the same types. Arrays in Java are actually covariant, just like the list type we have seen. So one would have that an array of non-empty sets is a subtype of an array of insets. But it actually turns out that this idea of arrays being covariant causes problems. To see why, consider this Java snippet below. We create an array of non-empties A, we assign it to an inset B, we assign empty into the first element of B, and we pull out the first element of A and assign it to a non-empty. So let's visualize what goes on here. In the first step we create a new array and fill it with a non-empty element, call it A. In the second step we assign A to B and that's actually reference assignment. So after this step we would have another pointer B pointing to the same array. In the third step we assign empty into the first element of the B array. So let me erase the non-empty value here and replace it with an empty value instead. In the final step we pull out the first element of the array, that's the empty value, and assign it into a non-empty set S. So what we would get is S of type non-empty equals E. Now something's clearly gone wrong here because we ended up assigning an empty set into a variable of type non-empty sets. So if types are supposed to prevent something it's precisely this, that, we that, that you can't do that. So what went wrong? So looking at the example again, the first line would execute fine, so would the second line because arrays are covariant, but the third line will actually give you something at runtime, namely an array store exception. So you would get a runtime exception that protects the assignment of empty into this array. What actually happens is that to make up for the problems caused by covariance of arrays, 
Java needs to store in every array a type tag that uh, reflects what, uh, at what type this array was created. So when we create a non-empty array, the type tag would read, well, it contains non-empty. So let me write this here. So the type tag would say, well, it's actually a non-empty array. And now when we assign something into an element of the array, the runtime type of the thing we assign gets checked against the type tag. So in our case here, we would be have an empty value, but the type tag would read non-empty, and that would give you a runtime error. Now, it seems that this is not a very good deal. We have traded a compile time error for a runtime error, and we have also paid the price for a runtime check that we have to do. Every ar array store has to undergo this, this check against the array tag. So one could argue that really it was a mistake to make arrays covariant. They produced a hole in the type system that had to be patched by a runtime check. And you might ask, well, why did the designers of Java do it in the end? Well, it actually turned out that what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to write a method such as sort. That would work for any array. So the way they would express that in the first version of Java it would say the sort method would take an object array, and then covariance of arrays was necessary so that an array of strings or an array of integers could all be passed to an object array. Of course, with uh, Java 5 and later on, you have a much better way of doing that. You would do it the same way as in Scala. We, you would use a generic type. But before, because generics were not available in the earlier version of Java, people might do with that. Now, can we somehow generalize what we've learned here? When does it make sense for, us for a type to be a subtype of another? And when should that rather not be the case? There's actually an important principle stated first by Barbara Liskov that tells us when a type can be a subtype of another. Essentially, what it says is, if A is a subtype of B, then everything one can do with a value of type B, should one should also be able to do with a value of type A. So we have the type B, that's the supertype, the type A is the subtype, and we say, well, if we expect that we can do something with Bs, then we can should be able to substitute an A for a B, and we can still do the same thing with an A. The actual definition Liskov used is actually a bit more formal, so here it is. I, the definition says, let Q of X be a property that's provable about object X of type B. Then Q of Y should also be provable for objects Y of type A, where A is less than B. So the original uh, formulation coached it in terms of what you can prove about objects, not what operations you can perform take what we've seen from Java back to Scala, then let's look at the problematic array example, but now expressed in Scala. Here's how you would do that. You would create an array of non-empty values. You would assign empty into the first element of the array B. So notice that array selection is actually expressed with parentheses in Scala, not brackets. So it's really the same thing as a function call. And the Underlying reason for that is that arrays are really specializations of functions in Scala. If you write code like that in Scala, then what would you expect to observe? Would you expect to see a type error? Or would you expect to see a program that compiles? And if you expect a type error, then in what line would you expect it? If the program compiles, would you expect to, uh, it to throw an exception at runtime? Or would you think it should run without exception? So you have six choices overall. Make your choice. So the correct answer is you would expect to see a type error in line two. Why? Well, because the A value was an array of non-empty, whereas B was an array of inset. But in Scala, arrays are not covariant. So you would not have a subtype relationship 
between those two arrays. And that means you will get a type error. It will say, I found an array of non-empty, but I've expe expected an array of inset.